I'm Paul Gray. I'm the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost here on the Berkeley campus, and it's just my great pleasure to uh, welcome all of you to this evening, which promises to be a, a very thought-provoking and, uh, and very provocative discussion. University campuses uh, have a, and the Berkeley campus in particular, has a unique responsibility and uh, a capability of providing a, a forum for balanced debate on major public policy issues of the day. And certainly there's no uh, more significant and more important public policy issue than the one we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, we're really proud to be joining with our co-sponsor of the evening's event, the uh, Commonwealth Club of California, in bringing the second of these Goldman uh, forums to the Berkeley campus uh, to increase public awareness on important issues of the day. And I want to take a second to most especially thank Dick Goldman for his sponsorship of this outstanding series of events under the auspices of the Goldman Forum uh, for the Press and Foreign Affairs. It's really hard to think of a more timely topic than the one that you're going to hear about tonight. The nation stands on the brink of war. Most of you probably just listened to the State of the Union address that made that crystal clear. No topic is higher in the public consciousness or more prominent in the media. Uh, with congressional authorization, the, the Bush administration is faced with a momentous decision about the uh, choice of whether to initiate a war in Iraq. The UN weapons inspectors have delivered yesterday their report to the General Assembly of the United Nations, and at the same time, US allies, especially France and Germany, are calling for more time for the inspectors to do their work. And domestically, Domestically, public opinion continues to grow more divided on the issue of a war in Iraq. And the State of the Union address that just occurred made it all that much clearer just how imminent such a decision really is. What is the where's the press in all of this? Uh, in the first Goldman Forum that took place back in November, uh, the program included New York Times publisher Arthur Salzberger, Jr. And he said during that forum, quote, the Times has sought to ensure that an open and honest political debate takes place uh, before the nation decides to go to war, to whether or not to wage war. That's, that's our job, end quote. And it's certainly true the press has uh, covered it with great detail, in great detail the preparations for, for the conflict, all the blocking and tackling that goes along with those preparations. It's saturating the media and is covered uh, every evening on the nightly news. But it might be argued that the press hasn't provided enough examination of the fundamental issues, the basic decision about whether the nation should in fact go to war, what, the issue of what will best serve the best, what will serve best the national interest and the interests of the free world taking the longer perspective. In a nutshell, has the press really provided an adequate examination of the cost benefits of the options from a national interest perspective? So tonight, that's the topic. Our, our panel is going to address that and the nation and the president face a decision, and I think you'll hear some interesting views on that decision in tonight's discussion. So thank you for uh, uh, allowing me to welcome you, and uh, on behalf of the university, I want to welcome not only our faculty, staff, and students, but all of you who come uh, from off campus to tonight's uh, particularly important event. And now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, former vice chancellor of the Berkeley campus, uh, 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 Professor Emeritus Mac Lech, who will welcome you on behalf of the Commonwealth Club of California. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to tonight's debate entitled, How Should We Use Our Power? Iraq and the War on Terror, brought to you from Zellerbach Hall on the campus of the University of California at Berkeley. This is the first in a series of programs co-sponsored by the Commonwealth Club of California, Chancellor's Office of the University of California at Berkeley, and the School of Journalism of the University of California at Berkeley. I am Watson Letch, a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors and a Professor Emeritus here at Berkeley. We also welcome listeners from across the nation listening to the Commonwealth Club's national radio network, the country's longest continuous radio program. And now, Orville, Dean Orville Schell of the Graduate School of Journalism at the University of California at Berkeley will introduce tonight's topic, Dean Schell.
Well, thank you, and thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, I think tonight really is one of those moments that we may look back on uh, as a tipping point. Um, this debate uh, will be the first of what I hope is a long series uh, that we will have to cover the important events that this country confronts in the future. As you all know, Hans Blix submitted his report to the Security Council tonight, uh, yesterday. Tonight, uh, President Bush made his uh, State of the Union message, and in the days to come, some very important decisions are going to be made, and implicit in those decisions will be a number of assumptions. Assumptions about how this country will deport itself in the world and how it will use its power, whether it will do so cautiously and reactively or more aggressively and preemptively. And this is really the subject of tonight's uh, debate. I just came last night from the World Economic Forum, and I must say the world is in a great state of indecision and discussion over the subject. American officials were very roundly criticized uh, in Switzerland, and I think the coalition of Europe and the U.S. Uh, is in many ways at risk at this tipping point moment. Now let me introduce to you tonight's two debaters. Christopher Hitchens was born in Britain. He was educated at Oxford. He's the author of numerous books, uh, the most recent about uh, George Orwell. He's also a contributing editor at Vanity Fair, and his work appears in many other magazines. And this spring, he will be here at Berkeley as uh, the Eye of Stone uh, teaching fellow. Mark Danner is American-born, educated at Harvard. He's the author of The Massacre at El Mazote, a staff writer for The New Yorker, and a longtime contributor to the New York Review of Books and he is a professor here at the uh, Graduate School of Journalism and directs this program. So without further ado, let me uh, bring out our two debaters. Now, in order to do this, uh, we're going to flip a coin to see who goes first. We'll start with statements, then with rebuttals, then with counter statements, and then some general discussion between the debaters. And finally, we will take questions from the audience. Uh, and we'll end in about an hour and a half or a little less. So, uh, Mark Danner, uh, Christopher Hitchens, um, if you'd please come out. <laughs> All right, we have a silver dollar here. Do you want to call? Heads, be heads begins. Mark, what do you want? Heads or tails? Christopher, would you like to call? Heads me. Okay, heads begins. And it is tails. So Mark Danner will begin. Uh, and it's okay, I, I wasn't ready. The timekeeper. <laughs> what was that? Christopher might like to take a look at the coin. <laughs> Maybe after the debate. I happen to know that it has Kim Il-sung on one side and Kim Jong-il on the other. <laughs> Both heads. Orville sits in his office and says, dear leader, Great leader, great leader, dear leader. You're using your time up, Mark. <laughs> thank you, Orville. Um, and thank you to Berkeley, and especially to Richard Goldman, for having this event tonight. As we've heard uh, ad nauseum, um, it is frightfully <laughs> timely. Um, we have just been gathered around the television set back at Northgate Hall. Uh, seeing uh, the President's State of the Union address in which he uh, not too fortuitously addressed our question, how should we use our power, Iraq and the War on Terror. He gave a speech, a very eloquent speech, I think, uh, that was full of fear and that answered to me what is really the underlying question there, which is what kind of a country are we going to be, and on what basis will we act in the world? Will it be out of fear and distrust of the rest of the world, uh, acting as a muscle-bound troll, secure in our power, flaunting it, blustering, 
or will we act cooperatively, multilaterally, trying to make the world better? We live in interesting times. This is, to my mind, the third time in the last century that Americans have gathered together to address this question. The first time was 1919, after the First World War, when Woodrow Wilson urged the United States to join the League of Nations. He was defeated in that fight, killed him, as a matter of fact. The second was the late 40s, when those people we now know as the wise men, uh, led by President Harry Truman, put together the world system uh, that has led us through the Cold War, NATO, the Marshall Plan, uh, the Western Alliance. We are at work on the same question today, and we're working on it in the shadow an event, of an event that has terrified the country, 9-11, the attacks of 9-11. Since that time, President Bush, with great eloquence and great determination, has put forward a certain view of the world. It divides the world into good and into evil. The United States is here to defend the good and to keep out the forces of evil. He talked about them tonight as the forces of disorder and chaos. Those who are not with us are against us. The war in Iraq, or the proposed war in Iraq, which now apparently has a date, uh, February 5th, or at least a date for its final uh, launching, February 5th, has fit under this rubric. Saddam is an evil dictator. He is erratic. He has weapons of mass destruction. He will never disarm. There must be regime change. Regime change, I would suggest to you, is one of the most noxious euphemism that American foreign policymakers and American politicians have yet devised. It belongs up there with surgical strike, for it suggests that the United States can change regimes in Iraq with all the difficulty and all the muss of changing a shirt. In fact, we're talking about attacking, bombing, invading, and occupying a major Arab country. During the speech tonight, there was not a word about occupation. My view during this debate, we'll have many different disagreements about military forces, about how risky this is, uh, and indeed it's quite possible that this war will leave dead no more than those killed during the Gulf War of 1991. Certainly American mil military commanders would be very grateful to take that bet, to take that deal. In 1991, only 200 Americans died. According to the Defense Intelligence Agency, 100,000 Iraqis died, almost all of those military, perhaps three or 4,000 civilians. I'm going to say that again, 100,000. This is regime change. Now, the president tonight, did many of you see this speech, by the way, or were you waiting in line? <laughs> well, the president tonight um, cited weapons of mass destruction he cited the risk of giving, giving weapons to terrorism. He cited what I think is probably the underlying region, reason, which is a strategic one, that uh, an unstable dictator would dominate the region of the Persian Gulf. I think we have to look um, during the days after 9-11. Um, I'm going to give you, anyway, a few, uh, pushing on my time, a few quotes from the councils of power in the days after 9-11. Uh, this is Donald Rumsfeld, courtesy of Bob Woodward, from September 25th, two weeks after 9-11. Look, as part of the war on terrorism, he said in a meeting, should we be getting something going in another area other than Afghanistan so that success or failure and progress isn't measured just by Afghanistan? Condoleezza Rice, should they worry about launching military action elsewhere as an insurance policy in case things in Afghanistan went bad? They would need successes early in any war to maintain domestic and international support. The United States' rapid victory in the 1991 Gulf War and the immediacy of watching it unfold live on CNN had redefined people's expectations about warfare. Uh, one minute, Mark. One minute. 
The inspectors are spread out across Iraq. It is impossible now for it to, to develop further weapons of mass destruction. It is clear that the nuclear program has been dismantled. El Baradai has already said that. The inspection regime can be strengthened with the addition of more inspectors, the imposition of smart sanctions directed uh, narrowly toward any implements used toward making weapons of mass destruction, and the U.S. should declare a policy whereby it will feel free to strike from the air those facilities that it suspects are making nuclear weapons, if those are indeed found and inspectors are denied access. Iraq effectively is contained. The United States, Al-Qaeda cannot defeat the United States, 5,000 religious, highly trained religious fanatics. But the United States can defeat the United States. It can defeat the United States by occupying a major Arab country, um, taking it over, and serving as a major recruitment sergeant for Al-Qaeda. Time. That went very fast. Yeah. Christopher Hitchens. <clears throat> Mark's applause isn't part of my time, I hope. Um, you want quick? I can give you quick. Um, I've written some um, attacks on euphemism myself. Um, surgical strike is only the least of them. Uh, Collateral damage is obviously the, the ugliest and the silliest of theirs. Uh, but let me begin, I'd like to, we don't have an actual motion for debate tonight, but we have a topic. And I'd like to have a sense, if I may. Uh, begin with a term that everybody knows, no-fly zone. That's the practice by which Anglo-American and formerly French uh, aircraft uh, prevents Saddam Hussein from operating against the Shia or the Kurds. Can I get, may I invite a show of hands, who would lift those no-fly zones today if the vote was up to them? Okay, no one I can see. Um, thank you. Uh, no, this is all about pluralism. Um, okay, have a show of hands for anyone who thinks oil isn't worth fighting about. Slightly more. Oil isn't worth fighting about. That's more. Okay, now I know what I'm up against. Um, the no-fly zones, I'll just ask one more question. Who knows whether those have UN authorization or not? They don't in case you don't know. In other words, what I somehow feel I'm up against is the following. An illusion that is common in the Middle East among people who aren't entirely paranoid, and an illusion that is common also in Washington among some intellectuals who suffer from hubris. And this illusion is the following. It is the illusion that the United States has the power to decide these matters uh, rather than simply to influence them, that all power rests in the hands of Washington. Unfortunately, um, to uh, correct the paranoids and um, perhaps also to redress the hubris of the neoconservative intellectuals. Such is not the case. What we are able to do is rather limited. But what we must recognize is that the war uh, or the engagement uh, with Saddam Hussein's regime has already begun. Uh, the, the policing of the no-fly zones is a declaration of war. It's a daily act of hostility. The Iraqi regime is within its legal right to try and bring those planes down and enable itself once again to fasten its rule upon Kurdistan and upon the south, but it's prevented from doing so by force. Meanwhile, uh, in northern Iraq, the forces of the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, who I choose as my side in this because I don't find anything particularly menacing in President Bush saying that sides must be chosen. I come from a tradition that asks, which side are you on in matters of principle and struggles uh, of freedom? Uh, is at war with the bin Ladenist gang known as Ansar al-Islam, which operates, it seems solely, with the intention of destroying the independent Kurdish leadership and state. Why it should choose this as the first target of its bin Ladenist holy war, why it should choose to make war on the same enemy as Mr. Hussein has, I leave to you to determine, though I have a very good suspicion myself. The, there is no escaping this confrontation. There is no neutralist or abstentionist position to be taken. The only position that cannot be occupied is that of wait and see. We are already engaged. And in some ways I find myself exhilarated by this prospect uh, because I don't know any Iraqi or Kurd who hasn't been waiting for many years for the day when the Saddam Hussein regime is completely dead and utterly buried. 
And we owe a duty to these people, having betrayed them and disappointed them so much in the past, having made promises that were not kept. We also owe a duty, it seems to me, to the four million Iraqis, that's four million out of 22 to 23 million, who are forced to live overseas in exile from their own country, terrified for their families, often with stories to tell, any one of which would chill the blood of anyone in this room. These four million people, qualified, educated, honest, hardworking, productive, it seems to me have the right of return. And it's a privilege to be able to say that one is on their side and able to hasten that day. It hasn't always been possible to say this in defense of the policy of the United States administration. Often one's had to choose between being a supporter of regime change and a supporter of the administration. I hope that that moment is now at an end. I'm willing to reopen hostilities with the administration if any division between these two objectives should open itself. But it does seem to me that by what might be called perhaps, with not too much of a stretch, a, Hege a Hegelian moment, I mean Hegel's famous phrase about the cunning of history, that by a long series of mistakes and crimes and blunders and other evolutions and accidents, the United States has placed itself or has emerged upon uh, the right side of history in this region. And I hope I have time to give the four reasons, principal reasons, why I believe that to be true. Um, the first reason I have, in a sense, already touched upon. There is a moral imperative for regime change in Iraq. Ever since the revolutions of 1989 that we thought would bring an end to the Cold War and the simultaneous terror of nuclear annihilation and the arms race, our hopes and our uh, peace and our peace dividends that we were hoping for have been repeatedly spoiled ruined, uh, compromised, set at naught or set at risk, by the revival of the remaining one-party state, megalomaniac, single-leader uh, despotisms. Slobodan Milosevic, Saddam Hussein in his annexation of Kuwait, Kim Jong-il. Uh, we are not yet through with the discredited idea of the one-party state, the hysterical state of leader worship, militarism, the cult of uniforms for school children and party salutes and all the aggression, chauvinism, hysteria and filth that goes with that. But we will outlive, one minute. I think, uh, such regimes. And this will be one of the tests. Second, it's quite clear that the, the oil resources of the world do not belong to whoever is in charge in Iraq. And we have the right to say that the oil of the region should be declared as common property. And blood for oil, blood for oil was shed when Saddam Hussein was able to gas the Kurds at Halabja and have nothing said by the administration. That was blood for oil. It was also fascism for oil. That was, when, that was when blood was shed for oil, when we stood by and preferred the stability of the regime to the matters of principle. On the weapons of mass destruction, I think I'm going to have to reserve my time. It looks as if I might even have to reserve it on international gangsterism and the support of the Iraqi regime for it, though both of these things are susceptible of very strenuous and exhaustive proof. My closing appeal will be this. It better be do not ask your yourself, time is up. Do not ask yourselves how others will vote in this or at the United Nations. Ask how you yourselves would vote if the casting vote was to be your own. That's the sense of we in this meeting. Thank you. I w Before we uh, move into the rebuttals, I want to admonish all of you in the audience to please hold your own comments. This debate is being held in the tradition of free speech, and I ask you to respect that. Look, if I may say so, Orville, um, I don't seek protection from people who make animal noises. Well, um, we're, it's perfectly okay by me. I have a broad back. We, we would rather... I uh, prefer they do it later with Christopher, then. Uh, Very well. Save your animal noises till after the uh, debate. <laughs> uh, we now move to seven-minute uh, rebuttals from each of you. Well, um, I feel like I'm debating Hegel a bit. Um, <laughs> because though Christopher's... Uh, address was a stirring one. I'm not sure what the reasons are that were stated for attacking, invading, and occupying Iraq. 
Uh, first, the war has already begun. That is, the no-fly zones uh, are in existence and they're being patrolled every day. I would think that would be a reason to say one needn't invade. The Kurds are being safeguarded. Uh, air defenses are being destroyed when they threaten alliance planes. Um, and, and in fact, Iraq, however much we talk about an aggressive dictator, is being effectively contained. Um, which side are you on? You have to choose, and there's no escaping this confrontation. I would agree with that. I think one does have to choose. I think the question is whether you believe the United States should now, can now protect itself by occupying a major Middle Eastern country. And I phrase that specifically that way. I'm very, uh, you know, Christopher and I have spent, I guess, our, our adult lives thinking about this question, um, how should we use our power? Um, I've written about Central America, um, Haiti, uh, in which we backed for many, many years a horrible dictator, uh, then helped him into exile, then made possible a democratic election in which Father Aristide was elected, then stood by the United States while he was overthrown in a coup, then returned him to power with an invasion and occupation, and then essentially let the country drift into, as Bush would say tonight, chaos and disorder. I've learned to suspect dreaming imperial dreams. I've learned to suspect United States American language, which comes very natural to Americans, about freedom, liberation, and making the world safe. Uh, it's language that is very effective, which is why American presidents use it. But I think of American foreign policy as a spotlight, pointed here, pointed there. For a few brief moments, we learn about a country, we learn everything uh, there is to know about it, we read in the papers, and then the spotlight moves on. And in the darkness, you find ruins, you find destruction, you find death. Um, it's happened again and again uh, over the Cold War and, the, and indeed the post-Cold War era. So I suspect the sentiment that everybody must choose uh, and that we owe indeed a duty to these people. I think our duty, first of all, is to Americans. First of all, to Americans. And I think uh, the idea that we can spread democracy throughout the Arab world by attacking, invading, and occupying Iraq is a fantasy. Um, I think it is true that, I think it is true, I think it is true that there are many, or at least some in the administration who believe this. The Deputy Secretary of Defense, Wolfowitz, Douglas Feith, one could name others, Richard Pearl. Um, it is unclear how much power they have. Uh, it is unclear, finally, whether their views will hold and whether, indeed, an occupation will stretch long enough and be firm enough and have sufficient soldiers to bring some kind of new stability to Iraq based on some kind of democratic order, given the sectarian differences in the country, given the history of minority regimes, given that the only nationwide institutions in Iraq are the army and the secret police which, by the way, are Sunni-dominated, minority-dominated, that is. To, so to establish a democratic system there is going to be extremely, extremely difficult, and it's going to take a great deal of sacrifice and dedication and money. Let, let us say these people do prevail in the, within the councils of the administration, that the occupation continues for 10 years. The question to me then becomes whether the political difficulties of doing this whether the fights for power within Iraq, whether the attacks on American troops, uh, whether the political struggles over retribution um, to get the torturers out of the government and out of public life, um, the political struggles between the exiles who Christopher so eloquently described and those struggling for power within the country, whether those can possibly contain by, be contained by an American occupation regime without indeed causing enormous political difficulties throughout the Middle East. Although the administration argues some days that democratization will spread like dominoes through the Middle East, where have we heard that before? Um, though it says this, it's much more likely, I think, after an American attack and occupation, uh, that autocratic control and repression will be strengthened among Iraq's neighbors, even those that are taking tentative steps toward liberalization. Why? Because you'll have anti-American demonstrations, you'll have uh, anti-American speeches, 
Uh, you'll have large gatherings in the street opposing military action against Iraq, and these regimes, who are very delicate, will uh, be inclined, as they almost always are, to attack vigorously to suppress them. Uh, it would be nice to know a little bit more clearly what the administration has planned for the occupation of Iraq. The president has been absolutely studious in not talking about the occupation. I have to return finally to the point about Al-Qaeda. What was Al-Qaeda trying to do when it attacked those buildings on September 11th? We've been so full, made, made so full of uh, theological language about good and evil that we can't see a very basic question in front of our face. What one were they minute. after? They were after, I'm sorry, is it one minute? They were after a reaction, an overreaction on the part of the United States. They hoped the United States would come into Afghanistan and kill tens of thousands of civilians. They are after a rising en masse in the Arab world. They are after, uh, they are trying to build a political movement in support of Islamist regimes throughout the Arab world, notably in Egypt and Saudi Arabia. There is nothing we could do. As I said, the Al-Qaeda, though the President has talked about that they want to destroy us, Al-Qaeda cannot destroy the United States. The United States can walk into a trap that Al-Qaeda has set for it and destroy itself politically throughout the Middle East, creating havoc where uh, none existed before. And I'd like to hear the answer to those questions. There you are. Christopher Hitchens, seven minutes rebuttal. Well, you tempt me to reply by saying where none existed before, but that might be a low blow of a reply. I think I've got, <clears throat> I've got time to focus on Strike two Strike where you like. Remember you said it first. Um, <laughs> I've got time to focus on two points. One is the one about regime change and occupation. I opened with the question of the no-fly zones and the Kurdish autonomous area for another reason, uh, which is as follows. Um, since 1991, in other words, for a little more than 10 years, we know what uh, regime change would look like in Iraq. We can't know everything in advance, any more than the people who urge caution upon us can be sure that their policy would not lead, as it has so far, to calamity. But we can know this. In the most difficult and dangerous and mountainous terrain of northern Iraq, the one most marked by tribalism and clan struggle in the past, and by other kinds of faction, uh, in the area that had been the most uh, cleansed, bombarded, uh, persecuted, and impoverished of the, of the entire country, in that northern sixth of Iraq, we have now um, 21 newspapers, I think it is, in Erbil, a parliament, uh, several parties, uh, four female judges, and the most recent parliamentary debate was on whether or not to abolish capital punishment, even though they hold a number of bin Ladenist prisoners uh, recently caught while attempting to kill uh, the elected leadership of this area. Well, furthermore, internet cafes, free exchange of goods, uh, trade, uh, movement, and so forth, um, and a certain amount of prosperity to go with. Those of us who talk about regime change, in other words, are not sucking this out of our thumbs. We're not being utopian. The ones who are being utopian are those who believe that by any combination of forces, regime preservation can go on any longer in Iraq. That is the truly idealistic and illusory position. Uh, on this matter of containment, therefore, bear in mind, and of realism, self-preservation, survival, deterrence, and the rest of it, bear in mind the following. Uh, when he was retreating from Kuwait, when he was giving up his invasion, occupation, and massacre of that country, Saddam Hussein gave the order that its oil fields should be blown up, should be ignited when he had nothing to gain and everything to lose, and when he had been warned very solemnly by the then Bush administration of dire consequences should he do anything so vandalistic. Nonetheless, he did so. He's continued ever since to risk his own life on a proposition that's now been repeatedly and demonstrably exposed, the idea that he can both stay in power and develop weapons of mass destruction. Clearly, this course of insanity means a great deal to him, and it cannot really be said that a man who's self-evidently now approaching his Ceausescu moment of political and moral and personal and political breakdown is a safe bet. This contingency, the implosion of his regime, is a certainty. That will happen anyway. 
and it will deliver to the international community an impoverished, terrified, long isolated and sectarian Iraq. That's in our future too. What then is the course of prudence and caution so often urged upon us by those who like to employ such terms as if only they understood them? The course of prudence and caution is clearly to be ready with as large a force as may be needful, military, <clears throat> medical, political, uh, with, with nutrition, with good news and with every other kind of uh, facility and resource to begin the long process of the rehabilitation of Iraq, the reconstitution of its oil industry, and the rehabilitation of its much damaged people. This will be a task that will fall upon the international community. In any case, I think the United States administration is to be congratulated for deciding to prepare to undertake this uh, before it will be needed. And bear in mind that no one else could do it even if the United Nations was to vote unanimously and urgently that it be done at once, it would still be to Washington that they would direct that request. Now, um, on the matter of uh, will we upset people if we resist them? I've heard this before. I remember being told a few years ago, not that many years ago, less than two years ago, if you kill Osama bin Laden, thousands more bin Ladens will arise in his place. I thought not myself. He looks like a one-of-a-kind uh, guy to me, <laughs> as does Saddam Hussein in many other ways. But I would add, suppose it to be true, though it is not true, if he's not dead, as I believe him to be, he's certainly very much in hiding. If he's to, if people rise up to take his place, they'll be killed as well. Of that I can absolutely assure you. And there are more of us than there are of them, and we are smarter and cleverer and more tolerant, and we too have unalterable convictions and we too believe that our culture and civilization mustn't be offended, defamed, uh, raped, and defiled. And we will fight for that. Do you remember, you now there's the question now, Mark Jenner suggested that what Osama bin Laden got, the total destruction of the regime that sheltered him, forgotten now in Afghanistan to the point where it's inconceivable that it could come back. The return of a million and a half Afghans to, to Afghan soil a population explosion of liberated Afghans returning, the utter destruction of the Al-Qaeda network in the country, the scattering of it across other territories, the constant harassing pursuit. The, 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 what he got, which, and that's what he did get, is what he wanted. He said, ah, oh, you're playing into my hands by doing that. I do not think so. And how, in any case, are we to predict what will offend these people? Has anybody read the Al-Qaeda communique, for example, hailing the murder of Australian holidaymakers in the island of Bali recently. Has anyone read the Al-Qaeda communique praising and justifying that? I, I'm sorry that no one seems to be putting up their hand. It's worth reading. What is the reason that it gives? Why must young Australians be burned alive as they're having a dance and a smooch? One Why? Because Australian troops took part in the independence process that separated East Timor from Indonesia. Not everyone could have guessed that or seen that coming. Uh, but I could have done and did. Osama bin Laden has repeatedly claimed that East Timor has no right to independence because its people are Christian. And Indonesia, remember, is Muslim and should be under the caliphate. So anyone, even belatedly like Australia, who helps the, the martyred people of East Timor, I use the word martyrdom metaphorically, uh, not fanatically, uh, must therefore be expected to be killed. It, such is self-evident. Now, I think I have to therefore leave Mark with two possibilities. One, well, knowing they were going to behave like that about it, we should probably have left these Timorese under Indonesian rule. Not a contingency that I hope recommends itself. Or second, we should ask ourselves all the time what they think of us. I think the time has come, after they've dived planes into my hometown and other people's hometown too, to make sure that they wonder first, last, and all the time what we think of them and, and to make sure that we do not reply in kind, but that our reply cannot be mistaken for cowardice or stupidity. Time. Thank you. Now we go to five minutes final reply uh, by each of you before an open discussion. Mark Danner. I have to think there's a species of child psychology going on here. Um, <laughs> perhaps okay, I'm this wrong. Better, this better be good. 
we had better not act, we had better not think when we act what Osama bin Laden wants, because if we do, we are doing his bidding and we're afraid of him. My proposition is that we shouldn't do uh, what Osama bin Laden wants because it's stupid. We should act in the best interests of our country. Our best, the best interests of our country uh, would lead us to act in a way that will not bring more terrorism to our shores. It would encourage us to act in a way uh, in which by occupying an Arab country, we do not shift the political winds decisively against us in the Middle East and put allied regimes under great stress. It would encourage us to do what we need to do to fight the war on terror without buying into and participating uh, in the political program launched by Osama bin Laden perhaps a decade ago. Um, Christopher talked about Afghanistan and what a, what a thumping we delivered there. Um, uh, Al-Qaeda and Osama is thought to be hiding out either somewhere in Afghanistan or in Pakistan, our great ally. Um, he also seems very willing to, when Osama bin Laden says, I want to launch a war of civilizations uh, against the West and thereby put in power fundamentalist regimes that will overtake, overthrow those that support the West, like those in Egypt and Saudi Arabia, Christopher seems to want to say, fine, bring it on. War of civilizations? Absolutely. I'm not afraid. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. They want one, they can have one. I can only repeat that it seems to me what we are talking about here is intelligent action. To act in the best interests of the country, to act to protect Americans. You know, Iraq now, despite the picture that President Bush drew of it tonight, is a country that is uh, semi-occupied in the south, semi-occupied in the north, with no fly zones from the west. It is covered with inspectors, with more on the way. The nuclear development program has been fairly decisively declared to be dead. It's true the other, the gas and uh, biological weapons have not all turned up, but I believe that they will if given sufficient amount of time. There will not be an aggressive attack from Iraq. Iraq is contained and there are things that we can do with the United Nations and with our allies to make that containment more secure. What can we do? More inspectors, more helicopters, more inspections, and even more vigorous uh, inspection regime that is open-ended, as by the way this one is. Um, smart sanctions f focused on military equipment. Nothing, no sanctions more on anything that can be construed as humanitarian. <laughs> which will solve political problems for us, among other things, in the Middle East. Um, third, um, a declaratory policy that sites that are not made uh, available to inspectors will be attacked from the air. Finally, a war crimes tribunal modeled on that of The Hague and uh, Arusha on Rwanda, connected with the United Nations, that would bring to bear dossiers on minute. the leading Ara Iraqi leaders, thus putting political pressure on those leaders toward regime change, as we called it, but regime change from within the country. In that war crimes tribunal, it will be quite clear that those who cooperate with the tribunal in uh, accomplishing regime change will have that taken into account by the tribunal. There are ways to devise policies to deal with this country. Um, it is reduced, its army is half the size as it was a decade ago. It is, its nuclear weapons program has been dismantled. Why do something that will essentially cost a lot of lives and leave us occupying Iraq? Why do we want to occupy Iraq? If a year and a half ago, on 9-11, you said, well, the next thing we should do after these religious fanatics attack the United States is go into the Middle East and occupy a country of 23 million. Time. 
for an unlimited amount of time. It would have seemed bizarre. It still should. No, no. There's nothing ironic in my applause for Comrade Downer here, because if you followed him closely, as I expect that you did, he said that each succeeding, each succeeding stage of intervention in Iraq was better than the last. Look at what we've accomplished with intervention. The Kurds are protected in the north. The Shia are prevented in the south. It doesn't look like they can rebuild their nuclear uh, reactors. It doesn't look as if they want to be doing very much more exporting of terrorism, uh, the uh, other weapons of mass destruction have been downgraded. Each, every successive stage of intervention on the side of regime change in Iraq has been better than the last. That's what I've been saying all evening. I'm only arguing that this, uh, this should be completed. And I'm saying that because, well, how hard is that? And I wonder who wishes it hadn't been completed in 1991, when it could and should have been, well, the arguments against it, thank you. Please hold your applause, it's out of my time. <laughs> the arguments against it were two. One of them was good, the other was bad. The argument the Bush administration, supported by Mr. particularly Mr. Powell, um, Mr. Armitage, um, and some others, the only person who's changed his mind on it since is, is Vice President Cheney, said, well, we didn't have a mandate to do anything except reconstitute Kuwait as a member state of the United Nations. Fine. Those who say that Republicans are hungry for war, conquest, and the rest of it should bear that in mind. We, we were mandated by the UN to, to liberate Kuwait. We can't go any further. Good. However, I think there was also a bad reason. They hoped that having been taught a lesson, Saddam Hussein would become again what he had previously been, a loyal client of the United States and a reasonable poodle, someone who understood who was boss. That's why I mentioned to Labger again, ladies and gentlemen, that was blood for oil. Why has there been no indictment of Saddam Hussein for genocide? The Genocide Convention, by the way, mandates immediate action by member states without further consultation on warning of genocide, both to punish and prevent. Why not? Because if the indictment was brought, it would be found that Saddam Hussein's most genocidal crimes were committed when he was an ally of Washington, D.C. And that can't be faced. But that was blood for oil, and that's when you should have put your silly placards up. Now, we have the chance now, and didn't, and still don't. As far as I can see, the anti-war movement acts as if the fate of the Kurdish people is a matter of indifference. Well, it's too late for that now. Anyone can see that a crisis crunch moment is occurring. Now, remember what I said about what Saddam did on his way out of Kuwait. See what he does now with the sanctions that only punish his people and not him. Who wants to prolong them another day? Only those who say give the inspectors more time are protracting the sanctions. The sanctions can go the minute the regime goes. Only two things can change, the sanctions or the regime. They're the only two variables. Lift the sanctions and you increase what's already happening. 10% of every trade in and out of Iraq is taken by the Ba'ath Party and its clientele. What do you think they want the money for? I can tell you, you already know what they're using it for. To re-equip for another war. That's what they're using it for. What is their past record? One of being irrationally vicious and dangerous even at moments when it couldn't really hope to do them any good. Now, that seems to me to complete the case for finishing a job that's already 12 years out of date. I would prefer to say, by the way, that um, this is a war uh, not between civilizations, but for civilization. We know very well that in the Arab and Muslim world there are innumerable allies of pluralism, of free expression, of democracy, and many more potential ones. It's just a matter of deciding who is going to win the civil war within the Arab and Muslim world that has begun and that has now, and been going on a long time, and that has now tried to engulf our own society. Read the, speech, read the speeches of bin Laden, it's my final re reply to Mark, my second point. Read the speeches of bin Laden and what he wants and what he thinks. They're very interesting. His sermons are well worth study. Condoleezza Rice, in my view, should have been fired for saying that they shouldn't be broadcast on American TV. Bin Laden in his, um, bin Laden in his statements has said the following repeatedly to his followers, he said. For us, the defeat of the Red Army in Afghanistan and the bringing down of the Soviet Union was hard. That was a tough war, a bitter war, a long struggle, a heroic but, but arduous one. So the second stage, the destruction of the United States, that will be easy. These people do not want to fight. 
They are fat, they're lazy, they're corrupt. They are run by the Jews. They think only of money. A great deal, it seems to me, depends on the number of ways, the variety of ways in which that hateful statement can and will be disproved and discredited. But make no mistake, the illusion here is on the side of our enemies, and that is to our advantage. This is the, this is the free form hour here, All quarter right. hour. We have to be spontaneous. <laughs> I've been practicing being spontaneous all day. <laughs> Much of the, the gravamen of Christopher's very eloquent remarks have been directly on the point, two points. Saddam Hussein is bad. Osama bin Laden is bad. I am going to save us a lot of time by conceding those points and save him a lot of time as well. I agree with those things. They are bad. The question we're debating today is whether, to go, whether it is wise to go to war in the Persian Gulf and to occupy Iraq. That is the question. The question is how to deal with this bad man, and it is a terrible regime. I'm startled to hear, and Christopher has repeated it a number of times recently, uh, that the regime is imploding, that implosion is absolutely definite. It is about to happen. I'm not sure quite what this means. It may be, uh, I mean, it strikes me a little like a policeman, you know, batting somebody over the head until they bleed and then arresting them for littering. Uh, indeed, the regime is imploding, he says. I have never seen or not seen any evidence of that, and I don't know anyone else who, who argues it. If indeed it's true, and if the regime is imploding because of uh, inspectors all over the country, because of no-fly zones in the north and south, because of diplomatic pressure, then I believe indeed we should let the regime implode and let someone else take power. What I object to is the necessity of invading and occupying the country and constructing a new Iraq. Uh, Christopher has been eloquent in describing the sorry history of 1991, when U.S. troops stood by uh, and essentially watched Saddam, Hussein's massac Saddam Hussein massacre tens of thousands of Shia in the south and Kurds in the north using his helicopters. The U.S. troops were there. They could have intervened. Indeed, uh, General Schwarzkopf could simply have said, stop, and they would have had to stop. It's possible that that uprising could have succeeded. Why did the U.S. not act then? Where has this recent absolute obsession with democracy come from? Um, I would argue that our intentions in Iraq, though as I've tried to suggest, the, regime, or the administration is split over this, but our bottommost intentions in Iraq are strategic ones. We don't like this man. He's an unreliable dictator, and we would simply like to replace him with as little bloodshed as possible. They don't have to do with making a new world in the Middle East. They don't have to do with democracy. They have to do with power, strategic power. And I think once you reduce the argument to those, that level, and I tried to quote a few remarks after 9-11 from Rumsfeld and others uh, that I think confirms it, once you can see that these are the interests, you can argue it on those terms. And on those terms, I can tell you that this seems to me a very uh, futile um, and possibly self-defeating thing to do politically, particularly since the regime can be handled by a strong, uh, by a strong containment re regime that is already half in place and that can be constructed with the help of the United Nations and our allies. All right, let's get a response here from Hitchens. Well, look, I think for the, um, for the first point I would say, if I was an Iraqi or a Kurd uh, sitting in this hall, and I dare say there are some, I might be a little nettled by the way that people talk about me as if I wasn't there. Um, the suggestion is that if these people were able to rule themselves or had the right to determine their own future, there would be chaos and inconvenience and so forth, or that they might need a permanent occupation. It seems to me that there's no evident uh, ground for either of those assertions. I repeat, in the most difficult and dangerous and mountainous area of the country, there is self-government by the Kurds. It's not, it's not under occupation. It could very well be uh, that the additional decade of misery, 12 years of misery and shame and bankruptcy and, and murder and terror that's been inflicted on the remainder of the country will require some kind of guardianship, stewardship, trusteeship, 
I, won't, I don't want to say mandate, uh, but you know what, what I mean, uh, in order for the repair of the society to begin, for the refugees to be allowed to return and resume work, and for the oil industry, which is now working on 20-year-old equipment, uh, to start pumping. And when that day begins, ladies and gentlemen, when that Iraqi pumping starts again, when they, ha they can call their oil their own, and when the oil isn't being used for the, for the uh, financing of a parasitic, sadomasochistic Caligula and his system, another good thing will happen. The Saudi Arabian oil monopoly in the region will be broken forever. Is there anyone who doesn't look forward to that day? or to being able to speak to the Saudis in the language that the administration should already be and have been employing to them. Some, some aims of regime change can't be publicly avowed by Republicans, but that doesn't mean they can't be publicly avowed by me. I hereby do so. Now, the word inspection is a ridiculous word in this context. Uh, the word really for what the 110 or so people on the Blix team is doing is, is a verification effort. There is no provision by any international agency for anything more than the verification of compliance. That means you go and you look, how many rods and so on and lasers did you have last time? Is the inventory still there? We'll need to check again and double count and so on. And if there's a discrepancy, we'll need to have it accounted for. To inspect a country the size of Iraq, you would need a regime change. You'd need to be the government of Iraq in order to verify what's happening at every site. And that seems to me perfectly self-evident. Furthermore, Kofi Annan, who's not the, the sap that some people take him for, but is certainly not a hawk, did want to reappoint Rolf Ekeos, the very distinguished Swede, who, and great international diplomat and civil servant, who conducted the inspections under condition, I might add, of a military occupation, which was all that made them possible, in 1991, and verified and blew up uh, more weapons of mass destruction than had been destroyed in the war. And so um, Kofi Annan said, okay, if we're going to have inspections, we want Rolf Akeas back as the inspector. I nominate him. Vetoed. Vetoed by France, vetoed by Russia. Vetoed by delegations made up of the clientele of Saddam Hussein's oil industry. In favor of Hans Blix, a man with a proven record of failure, who certified Iraq as exemplary in its compliance all through the 80s and 90s, and certified North Korea for good measure. Ladies and gentlemen, come on, this is Berkeley. We don't have to take anything at face value. Uh, my... It's a scandal, and I would add that for either France or Russia, faced with a 15 to nothing resolution that says this resolution stands until or unless it is materially breached, to threaten by any one vote to nullify it, to negate that resolution, is to be unilateralist. And I'll be very glad the first day I see the word unilateralist in the same sentence as France or Russia in the New York Times. Jacques Chirac, a man... I'll just say this. I think it's in Flaubert's Education Sentimentale. There's a banker. I think his name is Monsieur D'Alembert. At any rate, it is said of him by Flaubert, a man so corrupt that he would happily have paid for the pleasure of selling himself. <laughs> Jacques Chirac had to run for re-election. All right, Mr. He Hitchens, had to stay out of jail for corruption, which included bribes from Iraq. Let, let's this remember is, this, this is the interactive This is unilateralism, session. and it should be opposed by American internationalism. Thank you. All right. As I, saw, as I sat here watching, wondering forlornly when I would be able to speak, I thought, uh, yes, Flaubert, Madame Bovary, c'est moi. Well, she had other forms of consolation. She did indeed. <laughs> and I'm alone on the stage, alas. <laughs> Look, one can ridicule the inspection regime all one wants, and the UN is, a, is an absolutely fine thing to throw brick brats at. It, it's, you know, it's an old profession. Um, the fact is that this inspection regime eliminated their nuclear weapons programs during the 90s, um, and no one is arguing that that did not work. Under condition of occupation. Christopher May in a moment. Under condition um, of military the fact, the, fact, the fact is that indeed, indeed, uh, it did work. And the question is, what indeed are we trying to accomplish in Iraq? And we've heard a lot about how bad Saddam Hussein is. I've conceded this is true. The question is, is this what this is about? Do we want to invade to remove a bad man who we don't like? Or is it about a threat, a threat to Americans, a threat to American interest? If it's about a threat, which is what the administration has said again and again, 
harping on the issue of weapons of mass destruction, then that threat can be dealt with short of all of the risks of occupation, of invasion and occupation. Um, that is the truth. So we can ridicule inspections all we like, we can ridicule the United Nations. You know, at bottom this debate today is about how should we use our power. We don't like this man, we want to remake the Persian Gulf, we go in, we invade, we do it with military force. If people don't like it, notably most of the rest of the world, then we say the hell with you. And we think that we have enough power in the future, a preponderance of power, that we won't necessarily need allies again. We can do these things by ourselves. Um, that is the question that we're deciding here today uh, about Iraq, how we act in the world. We haven't brought up... Well, let's get a response uh, uh, rather to that. Well, let me make one last point, if I might. You know, the idea of intervention and intervening to remove someone we dislike, there were a lot of officials in the early 70s who terribly dis disliked Salvador Allende. They felt it was their right to interfere and to remove him. They thought he was leading Chile to a state of destruction, that he was killing people in the streets, uh, that Chile, as we know it, was going to be destroyed. They felt, to those who said he was democratically elected, they said, well, really, only a third of Chileans voted for him. All right, Mark, and let's they acted a, to remove him. Let's have a response. Well, 100% of Iraqis voted for Saddam Hussein, so I don't see how they could possibly make <laughs> that. And by the way, on 100% turnout as well. That's what I mean by Caligula. You have no idea what the texture of a regime of that kind is like till you've, till you've seen it. Um, they were wrong about Allende, by the way. The charges they made were provably false. I've refuted them myself in my book on, on Henry uh, Kissinger. Um, this, this is flailing, Mark, I'm sorry to say. Nor, I appeal to you, comrades, nor did I ridicule the United Nations. I think I demonstrated some knowledge of its internal workings, including the debate within Annan's own staff on whether to reappoint, reappoint. My, my question the only is, when do you have the right to remove a the regime? Only serious inspector, when do you have the right to intervene? Only, I'm coming to that. The only serious inspector that Iraq has ever had and the only serious inspection, not, not verification, inspection and demolition, which was only possible, I will remind you again, on condition of military defeat of Saddam Hussein and the physical presence in his country of international forces. Only under those conditions was that, in, that was an inspection and it could be carried out. This is a verification only, and the president tonight didn't have time to itemize even the objections made by Blix in his report. Bush mentioned a number of the missing weapons dumps and warheads and so on, and unaccounted for stuff and the insulting declaration by the Iraqis. He didn't get through all of what Blix managed to babble through. For example, that there is a U-2 plane at the service of the inspectors, the verifiers, uh, and the Iraqi government won't allow it to fly suggestive, I think, um, and many other things. The, 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 anyone who believes that the Iraqi regime has not now demonstrated material breach of a unanimous Security Council resolution has, a, has all the explaining to do. Those of us who knew that this would happen and that Saddam Hussein never lets you down were right, and we will be proved even more right when his regime implodes and when we find the mass graves and the secret prisons and see what's under some of those palaces and out of those mosques. And when we get the testimony of the victims and survivors, a lot of people who talk now and say no war with Iraq when they mean no quarrel with Saddam Hussein are going to look and I hope feel very foolish and perhaps worse. Let's have a response. The question is whether you want to, your aim is to disarm this regime, to disarm it and to contain it and to wait until it, as Christopher says, implodes. Or do you want to use the inspections as an excuse to invade and occupy it. This has been the dichotomy from the beginning, from the beginning of this policy in the fall. Are, is the inspection regime serious about removing these weapons? Is that what it's about? Or is it about providing an excuse for the United States to attack, invade, and occupy Iraq? And Christopher suggests Especially. in his remarks that indeed it is about an excuse to attack, invade, and occupy Iraq. And the legalisms, you know, he's willing to state all of these things. I mean, we can talk about Blix's report, who supported, uh, he did support very strongly continuing the inspections, as did it's El Baradai. Not, it's, not, it's not his um, job. It's not his job to make that recommendation. He exceeds his brief. Mr. Blix is not obliged to give advice of this kind, of war or peace. He's obliged only to say the whether point Iraq is that he emphasized not. that they had had access to the sites that they demanded, 
I, you know, one be, gets in a position of simply arguing for the Iraqi regime, and I'm not here to I do that. I wouldn't do that if I was you. I, I will not. <laughs> I will not indeed. Um, but the question again is, do you want to disarm him? I mean, are you taking this at, at, at face value, that you want to disarm this regime and take its claws out and take whatever threat that remains in it away through a multilateral process using our allies uh, and their support? Or do you want to make war? And do you want to use uh, the United Nations resolution as an excuse to make war? And indeed, the latter, uh, I think, is true on Christopher's part, and, and that is uh, a position. But I don't think one can really, in the end, base it on the United Nations process, because there is a process out there that will protect the United States uh, from Saddam Hussein. It's working. Um, and it's interesting that, you know, the European allies, a lot of other countries do not feel the kind of threat that we seem to feel in Washington. They are a lot closer. They are a lot closer. So we're back again to the question of how do we use our power? How do we use our power? Do we say this man is bad, we're going to invade the country, occupy it to hell, you know, launch the torpedoes, and we'll see, you know, if, we, if the occupation's difficult, if the reconstruction's hard, well, you know, we can get out of there, as we seem to do, have done partly in Afghanistan. Well, you know, we'll, we'll create the damage, but in the end, we can, we can leave. We can come back to our shores. Or do we do what, do we address the issue that supposedly is threatening us, which is weapons of mass destruction? If that is the issue, we are able to do it. If the issue is bringing democracy to the Middle East, then we're talking about imperial dreams uh, that we've been warned about again and again. You know, John Quincy Adams, in a famous quote of mine, said, go not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. Why not, he said. Um, in the end, uh, America might become the dictator, dictatress, dictatress of the world. She would no longer be the ruler of her own spirit. In the end, this has to do with us, with our attitudes toward the world, with how we act in the world, and how we behave in it. Okay, a short reply. Well, I'd warmly second that, and I, I'd say I think it's a happy series of coincidences, as well as some very unhappy elements of history that have brought the United States to the point where it is objectively, and now decisively, on the side of regime change in Iraq. I don't stipulate war. I don't stipulate invasion. I don't stipulate... Uh, occupation. I stipulate the United States should be on the side of regime change in the region, and you know as well as I do, as well as everyone here does, there wouldn't be a single verifier or inspector in Iraq if it wasn't for the absolutely believable threat of force. Indeed, there wouldn't even be a resolution addressing Iraq's violation uh, of all these uh, codes, treaties, and resolutions. And I myself believe, and will state again, that Iraq's repeated defiance of all these resolutions on genocide, on human rights, on weapons, and on the respect of the borders of other countries and the support for international terrorism, if allowed to continue, would be a far greater negation of the principles and the practice and the institution of the United Nations. If you are not than for any, war, than any, than any for speech, regime change. Than any speech made by... War, you, war Mark, re requires that two countries pit their armies against one another for indefinite combat. I'm willing to bet you now and anyone else here who'll take my wager there will be no such engagement in Iraq. It will I be see a, we're, redef there will be a we're military, redefining the There will be a military... The there will be no. There will be... You said war, not I. I have used the word war all evening. There will be no... There will be no uh, war. There will be a, a fairly brief and ruthless military intervention to remove the Saddam Hussein regime long overdue. <laughs> well... Orwell, you know, Orwell would be I've, proud, I've, of, I've would be proud of that myself, construction. I've already made myself the... Um, I've made myself the hostage to anyone who wants to make that noise again a few weeks from now. <laughs> so come and make it. By the way, if you knew how you sounded when you made it, you might make it less. If, uh, if wait, if, just a second. Now, if I, implosion, I excuse, me, if implosion I, excuse me, is, I'm, I'm, is I'm the challenge determinative. Here. I've been challenged here. If implosion I've been challenged here. is determinative I've and will happen no matter what we do, I've been then why indeed need there be a because ruthless be brief military because would intervention be, because it would not be defined as war? Uh, please don't if indeed talk implosion together. is about to happen... Well, I can't uh, answer the question if you keep asking it. Yeah, Mark, I give you 30 seconds to ask the question I, and no, you hit I have the question. Th I have okay. the question. It's been asked repeatedly. I've said 30 again, seconds to reply. It would be treating very meanly by the Iraqi people and by their neighbors and by ourselves if we simply said, let's, let's watch the place fall in on itself as the regime collapses. And, and 
see what happens. Then you would get ethnic strife. Then you would get revenge killing. Then you would get a total social breakdown. And yes, you would tempt other countries, neighboring, or factions within them to intervene. That would be the most irresponsible outcome of all. And bear in mind, this is taking place on top of about 9% of the Earth's uh, proven oil resources, and it's not a matter of indifference if someone with a dirty bomb or some other device decides to try and ignite them again. No, there should be an international readiness to intervene and place Iraq in a friendly internationalist uh, trusteeship. So the responsible the, thing I, did is I mention, to invade. Excuse me, my answer, you will notice, didn't, didn't mention the questions of weapons of mass destruction. That is only the basis on which the United States can approach and I'm not a spokesman for this administration. All right, gentlemen, I think we can approach we'll, the United uh, Nations, but there are f at least four reasons, all of which I gave. International support for international gangsterism. Uh, uh, Hitchens, I think Violation we, of the genocide we, we convention. We will not... Uh, all of these are cases for regime change on their own. Taken uh, together, they're overwhelming. I, I they're think this, this debate needs a little stewardship of its own, uh, and I'd like to exercise that now by moving to questions uh, yeah. from you all in the audience. Um, is there a moral imperative, if there is a moral Im imperative for regime change in Iraq, is there a similar imperative for regime change in North Korea? Perhaps Hitchens would like to commence. Well, North Korea is the only place that I've been, I'm quite well up on my axis, by the way, that is worse than, that is worse than Iraq. In, in, in North Korea, levels of horror uh, occur that Saddam Hussein can only dream of, the citizen is entirely the property of the state, and the entire state and society is organized permanently for war. And um, of course, it's also true that this party state and its fantasy leader will too uh, face and suffer the condemnation of history and will collapse, but under circumstances that might not be favorable to us if we couldn't help to shape them. The difference in this case is that we are not able to, to influence this outcome militarily. That's for a simple reason that I think now most people get. I've been to the DMZ that divides <clears throat> Korea, the demilitarized zone, one of the nastiest places on earth. I've, I've also been right up close to it from both sides. I've seen it from both ends. And um, it's only something like a 40 minute drive from the capital city of South Korea, Seoul, which is now, after a long and honorable struggle in which I was proud to play some part, uh, the capital of a thriving democracy. Um, it's within range of an extraordinary number of Korean North Korean weapons systems. It, the thing's been wargamed minutely and several times. Uh, if there is another war on the Korean Peninsula... But Mr. Hitchens, the question is, do you favor, in effect, regime change in North Korea? Oh, well, d does anyone think I haven't answered that question? Rather I, mixed I, response. I do. Yes, yes, no, I certainly do, but I'm saying it, can't be, it cannot be brought about by military intervention because it's been wargamed. Another war on the Korean Peninsula, however it begins, um, I think the question, we'll, or rather, however the question it ends, was really, the we'll, we'll begin was really with the destruction about, of the city of Seoul, the question, which is considered too high price. The question to me was really about whether, indeed, um, uh, given the administration's statement about weapons of mass destruction and about the axis of evil, whether, indeed, they weren't being uh, remarkably inconsistent in calling the North <clears throat> Korea situation now not a crisis and keeping it off the front page. Um, and turning uh, determinatively to Iraq. Um, I agree with Christopher that you cannot attack North Korea militarily. The risks are too great, mainly because, not only because they have probably a couple of nuclear weapons, but they also uh, have, it's mainly because of their conventional forces, as he suggests. I think it is worth adding, though, that the rhetoric, you know, we're a year now on from the axis of evil speech. Um, in which essentially the idea of attacking Iraq was introduced in the State of, U the, State of the Union address by President uh, Bush. Um, during that time, the North Korean situation uh, has declined precipitously. And uh, as inspectors in that time have moved into Iraq and troops have surrounded the country, inspectors have been thrown out of North Korea. It has withdrawn from the non-proliferation treaty. Uh, nuclear material that was under seal and under observation has been taken out. We don't really know what has happened to it. It could be right now uh, being formed into nuclear weapons. The country has probably the capability of producing a half dozen or so a year. Um, and the Bush administration has presided over an ideologically fueled disaster on the Korean Peninsula. 
largely because of their aggressive language, because uh, they seem to have thought they could deal with this problem by yelling about and denouncing um, Kim Jong-il and not dealing with it diplomatically. Um, that strikes me as a much more dangerous, dangerous to the U.S. interests, dangerous to our allies, uh, situation that we're essentially keeping on the back burner. Indeed, we found out about uh, the uranium program that was started there uh, in October, and it was kept from Americans for a period of weeks while the congressional vote on Iraq went on. Mark, while let's the debate now went on. have a quick, uh, I yield 30 seconds to Hitchens to reply. Listen, I urge you, listen to Mr. Tanner. North Korea threw out the inspectors, resumed production, put the uranium rods back in to the reactors. Did this under an inspection regime. Not a very high vote of confidence in the ability of inspectors to stop proliferation. That's, Total a, nonsense. that's a ridiculous and it did point. So, and it did they pulled so, out of the inspection regime. They pulled out of the and it did inspection regime. Yeah. They pulled, they pulled that's out. That's an absolutely no, they, ridiculous, they threw ridiculous, ridiculous argument. I said they let's take turns. Stop it. Uh, wait, 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 no, I'm sorry. I didn't, that wasn't yeah. 30 seconds. The I nuclear said, material Mark, was contained if I began, uh, for if a half I, dozen years. Mark, let, let excuse me. Hitchens have his 30 seconds. If I began by saying they threw out the inspectors, it seems to be otios of you to say that they also withdrew from the inspection regime. I'm sorry. Um, this was all done, this absolute I'm violation sorry, of what had been an inspection regime, all done under no military threat of any kind from the United States, and it was a process that was begun during the so-called sunshine diplomacy of a man I consider to be a great man, uh, President Kim Dae-jung. All the time that every inducement and every kindness was being shown towards the Kim Jong-il regime, this process was going on that's now just been consummated. It seems to me exactly to argue against the reliance upon uh, trust, upon inspection, or upon verification. All right, these so things, are, these things all exist at the whim of one party madmen who can negate them at any moment. We this no longer is, wish to live at their whim. Uh, this is Mark, a, ridiculous, a very brief reply. I want to move on to other questions. Look, this is a ridiculous argument. The fact is that the regime in place kept this nuclear material under observation for, what, eight years, and it worked. It worked. To say that because you can to, to say works? that because you can throw work. out to say that because you throw out inspectors, um, that proves that the inspection regime can't work is to say that the non proliferation treaty itself simply doesn't work. Doesn't and without work with without the non proliferation treaty, we would have nuclear regimes doesn't all work with over the globe. one party states. Gentlemen, I think that we are going to end it did the work end this question here because you can uh, uh, go at it backstage afterwards. Let's move on. Oh boy. Uh, why is it proving so hard to build a multilateral coalition behind this war? Mark, let's start with you. I think a lot of other people think it's a stupid thing to do. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's all very well to sit here and make fun of the French and make fun of the Germans yes, and make fun of very many people. <laughs> <laughs> Christopher's done it for years. A lot of other people do it. You know, it's, it's great sport. It's great sport. I've done it myself on occasion. But the fact is that these countries, and also to say, well, their motives have to do with the oil contracts. That's actually why they're acting, as if the United States didn't have similar motives in Iraq. Um, I'm not saying that's their only motive by any means, but obviously there are commercial motives here for all sides. There's no question about that. The fact is uh, that uh, our major allies think this is a foolish thing to do. Why do they think it's a foolish thing to do? Because they think this country, which has been reduced by sanctions, which is much of its territory covered by no-fly zones, which does not present any kind of imminent threat to its neighbors, can be contained indefinitely. And that attacking it um, and occupying it is foolish and politically will redound uh, to our detriment uh, into the future. That is why it's been hard to assemble a multilateral coalition to oust him. Um, it, I don't think it's any more difficult than that. I mean, Christopher will talk about, well, the Saudis, well, they let, fear democracy not, next door. Let's let Christopher uh, talk about whatever he wants to talk about. I, I, Hitchens, I'm, I would rather describe I can what Christopher wants that, to talk uh, about. I feel I can um, do it much more lucidly, well, really. Well, in, I and can't, and I show can't, the, the okay, disadvantages uh, of his arguments more Mark, effectively. Uh, hold your, hold your piece. I can't completely accept the grammar of the question because it isn't that hard to assemble an international coalition. 
the, res the relevant United Nations uh, Security Council resolution was passed unanimously and included the vote of Syria, um, among others. And the only question now is whether um, the Iraqi contempt for this resolution, which has been admitted even by the notorious softy, uh, Mr. Blix, will be considered a material breach or not. I don't think an objective person can be on, of two minds about that. Second, um, I, would make, I would draw a distinction between the behavior of Mr. Chirac, who built Saddam Hussein a nuclear reactor a few years ago, knowing what he wanted it for, and who, as I say, is a, is a pimp and on the take and has been all his life, and, Monsieur, and, and Herr Schroeder, who has uh, something to deal with in Germany, which I don't mind at all, namely a, a, a public opinion that has a very strong tendency to neutralism, even to pacifism, and a, 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 a great reluctance to have German soldiers outside the borders of Germany. I find I can live with that. Um, <laughs> and I find that the bit about it I like the best is the only person who ever persuaded the German people that it would be worthwhile sending their soldiers to another country was Joska Fischer, leader of the Green Party, saying he thought it would be good if German soldiers played a part in the liberation of Kosovo and Bosnia. And under those conditions, German soldiers were sent overseas. It seems to me that the limiting case almost makes the previous case a stronger one. Um, I think I have as good a claim to be a European as um, some of the people. Uh, uh, my father's uh, family comes from Cornwall and my mother's family uh, comes from what was once Breslau um, and is now Rochwaw in Poland. And I'm a member of the Advisory International Board of the Committee for the Liberation of Iraq, which contains on its letterhead a very large number of former statesmen from Lithuania, Estonia, All right, uh, Bulgaria, I think, uh, we, Czechoslovakia, let, let, Poland, the Czech Republic, where the, 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 the preponderance in the countries of the former Warsaw Pact who favor the, the making an issue of principle of dictatorship and human rights, as well as its inevitable partner, uh, aggression and terrorism, is impressive to see and a great deal more impressive uh, than the bleatings um, from Gay Paris. Let's try another question. If we use force to eliminate a regime we despise, uh, namely Iraq, uh, who else is on the list? Mark? I can't speak for who else is on the list. Um, I think uh, it's clear that the administration hopes that in some way this will be a lesson uh, to others. Um, it's unclear what kind of lesson will be delivered. Um, it may be a lesson that it is better um, to have nuclear weapons, um, as Kim Jong-il does, than to have a program uh, that is uh, aimed toward, at some point, making them. That is, that any regime who is in the sights of the United States or can be um, thought to be a rogue regime had better uh, get nuclear weapons that can deter a U.S. invasion um, as quickly as they can. Um, it's interesting, the effect um, in the last year uh, on the North Korean regime, um, the effect that the administration has had, both by promulgating and including them in this axis of evil, um, and also by speaking very aggressively to them and suggesting, in effect, that North Korea will be next. Um, they have responded aggressively in their turn. Uh, which was not very surprising to most people who know a lot about North Korea. If you read the paper and follow this, you'll see it. Uh, and Christopher's characterization, by the way, of recent history, all I can ask is that you read The Two Koreas by Don Oberdorfer or some other book which will give you an account of what actually happened there. Um, it is a much more uh, frightening crisis. But I can't speak for what country might next be, uh, next be on the list. Hitchens? Well, I have read the Oberdorfer book, and there is indeed a very chilling passage in there on the day that Mr. Clinton very nearly decided to bomb North Korea and go to war and on what it would have taken uh, out of both sides if for that to happen, uh, including a very large number of American servicemen. But if we are to be absolutely callous about this, which I don't necessarily recommend, North Korea can't really threaten anyone except South Korea at present, and conceivably, very, very improbably, Japan. It does raise the threat, not that... Uh, that uh, the fatuous one, I'm sorry to call it, uh, that you raised, that any country with a quarrel with the United States would now think better have a nuclear weapon before we quarrel with them. That's not the problem at all. It does raise the threat that Japan would renounce its anti-nuclear constitution if faced by North Korean 
nuclear weapons. So there would then be a triangle of nuclear powers in the area, China, North Korea, and Japan. That would be very destabilizing. And Taiwan, perhaps. And Taiwan, conceivably, too. That's uh, much worse. Most intriguing to me was the way, was the help that uh, North Korea got uh, from Pakistan uh, in developing its program, in trading missiles to so on. Uh, because obviously the thing that was wrong with the Axis of Evil speech was not the two main states that it did mention, which the president got exactly right, uh, North Korea and Iraq, um, but the one that it mentioned wrongly, Iran, which is in transition to democracy. And by the way, if you consult the Iranian street, you'll find they're all solidly in favor of regime change in Iraq uh, next door and looking forward to it as an ally in their own struggle for transformation. That's why people don't say Iranian street, you notice, though there are quite a lot of Iranians. Um, and second, because it shows um, uh, 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 an unwillingness on the part of the president to name the two countries that really were behind al-Qaeda, the two regimes that were, the uh, Saudi Arabian oligarchy and the Pakistani secret police ISI. All right, uh, thank you uh, both, and I want to thank all of you for coming. Also, I would like to thank the Commonwealth Club and the Chancellor's Office. We we'll hope to see you soon.